one of the things that I get reminded of fairly often is um, I am not I'm not one of those people who is the uh, the jack of all trades, um, and I'm definitely not the master of one. I, I've I've got a lot of areas where I'm just plain weak, and a lot of things that I'm I need to continue learning and picking up. But one of the things, if anyone needs a handout, raise your hand. I'm sorry, this is a new one. This will be a three weeker. Uh, so if you need the handout, somebody's in the back bringing those to you. Okay, thank you. I forgot about that. One of the things I'm really weak at is construction. Uh, my family knows that very well. Um, I, I am one of those people that if you're doing a project, I can come alongside you. I can help you. I can carry wood. I can use a tape measure. You show me where you want it cut. I'll cut a straight line, but I am not the guy to head something up when it comes to construction. And I know I'm not. Uh, and I admire people. I really do. If somebody can take a plan and they can look at it and they can follow it and what actually comes up looks right and it looks useful and it's not <laughs> weird like if I had done it. I admire people that can do that. And beyond that, I admire the people that can actually look at a piece of ground and then design something based on what they know about that ground and what's under that ground and how they're going to lay that foundation and all of that. They, they come up, they can figure out you know, how much weight can be supported, how much weight that house is going to have. And I cannot, for the life of me, Imagine being able to construct something like that. That takes some know-how. But think about this. Let's just say for, for giggles, if you have a guy, I ran into one of these, it's quick story time, off the cuff, but there was a young man that I, I worked with back before I had gray hair for sure, but he was young at the time and I would watch a few of the things this, this boy, now a man, built. And he would build houses off the side of a mountain. And I was just thinking, how does that thing stay on that rock? But this guy was good. And I, I grew to admire how much talent was in there. But just imagine if that guy had, had designed a building. And we'll make it just a simple building. But he designed this thing puts the plans together, it's the perfect house. Everything about it is gonna be good, everything's right. And then he hires a contractor to come in and build on it. How do you think he would feel if he had designed, you know, the outside is one bedroom, it's gonna be a 15 by 15, and the contractor says, you know, I think this house, that bedroom, it should be a 16 by 16. So we're just gonna extend the boards a foot off the foundation on every side. And just let them make, there, there's enough support there to be okay. And then he decided instead of putting on shingles, we're, instead of putting on metal, we're gonna put on shingles on the roof. And I don't think this thing needs hardwood floors. I think we're just gonna put on some cheap linoleum. And we, this contractor comes in and he doesn't follow the plans of this guy that is a master builder. He takes all these shortcuts to save money. My guess is that that contractor is going to be fired, if not sued. The guy who designed that house knows exactly what he wanted. He knows how to do it. And he expects the contractor to follow his designs. The Bible uses a lot of different analogies when it comes to God building his church. And one of those analogies is a building. He uses this analogy of, of building the church with a building. He uses it with uh, you know, developing his bride. But here we're going to be looking at this master builder. God has a perfect master plan right here. 
He has the master plan to build his church in the way that he wants it. And far be it from you and me to go and decide, you know, I think this room needs to be a little bit bigger. We don't need hardwood. We can just stick with linoleum. It's not up to us to either cheapen God's plan, to change God's plan. He wants us to follow his plan. So he left us with the plan. He left us with the word of God. And that's not, that's not all he did. He left us then with his Holy Spirit to come along and remind us of what his plan says. The Holy Spirit is constantly working in us to remind us, to convict us, so that as you and I, to use this passage, are building his temple. As we're building his church, we do it in the way that he wants it built, in the way that he designed it. God expects you and I to know his plan. He expects you and I, not, not just to know it, he expects us to follow it, he expects us to obey. He expects us to know his word and to put it into practice. I remember one time I had set up and for those of you who don't know me that well yet, um, my background was finance, and I, I enjoyed that. And I used to set up financial systems for churches, and one of the times I set this thing up, it was right, it was good, it worked. Could someone do it better? I'm sure they could. That's not the point. It worked, and it was a, it was a good system. I had tested it, and all that needed to be done was for that person, I won't point at anyone else, but that person, people, to use that program the way it had been written and just do my plan. It didn't take long. Matter of fact, it was probably within a day, maybe two. All of a sudden, something was messed up. And I was ringing, I, my first thought was, ah! Yeah, I didn't know what had happened. I know this thing worked and it didn't take long. I started looking at the program and what I had done and I noticed something was off. And so I, I started asking some questions and, and here's what had happened. One of the workers decided that they knew more than I did and they wanted to make that program better. And so they changed it. And it didn't work anymore because they didn't know what I knew it, on that one. They didn't know what I knew. And, and, and they messed up my program. I want to suggest to you that we can do this very easily when it comes to working with people. And that's what the church is. The church is not these walls. The church is us. And as you and I are working with people's lives, And we don't follow this book, it will always lead to corruption. We have got to follow the scriptures when we are working with people's lives. And we're going to see that as we go through these few verses. So in our text today, we're in the text we're starting, we're going to be seeing that the church is God's building. The church, a few verses later, we won't get there today, but it is God's temple. He wants you and I to build onto his church. And he wants us to do it in a way that brings glory to him, in a way that follows his blueprints. And he cautions us when we don't. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at our new text. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you that you are working. I thank you that you are building us individually. You're building us as a church. Help us, God, to be sensitive to your leading. Help us to be passionate about knowing you and knowing your word and following you. And God, I pray you would use us 
Help us to build in such a way that would bring you glory, that would benefit others, and that would not just put the emphasis on us. Lord, as we look at this text, I ask for your help. Please help my words to be accurate. Help the teaching to be right. And Father, I ask that you would use it to build us. Use it to grow us. Lord, I pray that in some way you would allow yourself to be glorified by our time here together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll be starting with verse 10. That handout you have is going to be three weeks, so keep hold of it. We're just going to be looking at point one today. How we build the church is serious. How we build the church is serious. And by this, I mean God takes it extremely serious how we build on his church. I've likened it before when, especially dealing with couples, this idea that uh, as a husband is treating his wife, he needs to, as dealing with his wife, he needs to remember something very important. That is God's little girl. That is God's daughter. And we need to treat, husbands, I'm just picking on you for now, we need to treat our wives understanding that's God's daughter. He cares about her. And therefore, we better care about her. And we better treat her in, in the way that Scripture as a, tells us as a precious thing, as a priceless thing. We need to treat her correctly. God takes how we deal with each other extremely serious. And here's the premise that I am starting this whole thing with. And you need to understand this premise. Every one of you who claims the name of Jesus, you are involved in this building. You, you don't have an escape out. You are involved in it. Every follower of Jesus affects the building of God's church. And by extension, then you'd have to say the global church, but in this sense, our local assembly, every one of us is affecting it. And to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not really not that involved. I'm not affecting it that much. Listen, your idleness, you're doing nothing affects the building of this church. It affects the lives of people in this assembly, and it doesn't affect it positively. Our idleness, our doing very little can tear people down. So I want to submit this to you. There is no neutral. You're not doing nothing in the sense of the building of the church. We are Every one of us, we're either building onto this church with quality materials. There's one option. We're building onto this church with worthless materials. There's another option. Or you're destroying it. You're doing something to build or not build on this church. And it is an active choice that you and I make daily. Every one of us make this choice every day. So let's look at these verses. First thing, how we serve matters. How we serve, it matters. Verse number 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereon. So Paul, he is the one, he says here, I'm the one who laid the foundation. I'm the one who did this in your church, Corinth. I'm the one who came in. And now after I built on it, other people are building on my work and they're continuing it. But notice how he starts this, according to the grace of God. According to the grace of God, I appreciate that Paul did this. He is saying, you know what? This isn't about me. It was according to God's grace that all of this happened. And you remember what this chapters one through three, he's dealing with this heavily division in the church. Everybody's saying, well, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. 
And he's saying, it isn't about me. I did this according to the grace of God. And that word according, it, what he didn't say was this, out of the grace of God. It's not just that, oh, God has this grace and he gave me a little of it. That's out of. That is given a portion of. He is saying it was according to. That word, we would use a phrase like this. It was in proportion to God's grace. Think about that for a minute. How much grace does God have? I mean, it's infinite. God just literally showers us as people. He showers us with his grace. He allows us to enter a relationship with him. He allows those who reject him and figuratively spit in his face. He allows them to keep breathing. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's a really good thing. I'm not God. I would have stepped on me a long time ago, squished me, and made a new one. I would make something that was worthwhile. Our God is gracious. And that, that his grace just never stops. And Paul is saying that same level of grace. God just poured it all over me so that I could start building this church. It was God who did this. So God covered Paul with grace to start these churches that he's been working in. We would use another phrase like God enabled him. God helped him. So Paul, I just want us to understand from this first little phrase, Paul is not bragging in any stretch of the imagination about what he accomplished. He's saying God is the one who did all of the enabling with this church to get started. And what that shows us is the, the, the primacy of God. How awesome our God is. How loving our God is. And I would just challenge us every time that you and I are kind of stepping back and seeing how good he is. And the tendency being at times, I'm so thankful that so-and-so was in my life. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for them. You go back to remembering all is by the grace of God. We should be praising our God for any good that comes in our lives. I don't know how you do this, because I, I, I'm just telling you, from my experience, what I do way too often is I'm thankful for people. I praise people as a first response. You know, my praise needs to go to God, and he's the one that needs to get it totally. I do need to be thankful for you. I need to be thankful for those that God brings into my life. My praise better go to God. He, it is his grace that allows all of this. So let me ask this question for us today. How, how do we experience this enabling grace of God? I think if I went around this room, everybody would say, yeah, I, want, I want God's enabling grace working through me. I want God using me. I want to be I want to be controlled by him. I think everyone who is a follower of Jesus would say, I want God working in me. I want to be his vessel. So how do we get this? I want to just really quick suggest this is not a mystery. This is not something that we've got to try to go figure out. I'm just going to word it a different way for us. We all want, we should all want to experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We should want God working through us so that we can experience that love, joy, peace, the, just the character of God coming through us. Every one of us should want this. That comes as we yield to him as we're filled with him as we submit to him that is when you and i experience this fruit of the spirit and that's when we'll be best able to be in, enabled by our lord 
That's when we are best able to be used of him to further his kingdom, to build each other up, to edify one another. We need that. We need to consciously, intentionally walk with our Lord on a daily basis. It's not going to come because we grit our teeth and because we you know, hunker down and just do it. We need to be calling on him. Asking him to help us, asking him to open our eyes, reveal to us, where am I, where am I going off? Where am I failing you? This needs to be a passion. And we need to beg God. Just like David begged him, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Something's missing. We need to constantly call on him. And I will warn you with this. If you've got the attitude, which it's easy to come up with sometimes, I'm doing pretty good. That's when you might want to take a couple of steps back and say, God, open my eyes. Paul said very clearly, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Any good that comes of us is God working through us and in spite of us often. So Paul says here, again, back to verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, that word wise is skillful, as somebody who is talented as a master builder, and he uses this analogy, he was like a skilled master builder. And that word is one word there, that skilled master builder, one word, and it's somebody who is a gifted architect. They're the ones that can design that whole plan and it's the one who is the general contractor. So it's the one who comes up with the plan, it's the one who, who uh, works the plan, who does all, they superintend all of the work. That's the word we have where Paul is saying, I, as a wise master builder, he's the one that was doing it all. And that's Paul, that's how he described himself. And it was based on, going back to the first part, that grace of God that was given to him. He had no bragging rights. He's saying, God enabled me to do this, to work as a wise master builder. In doing that, he said, I have laid the foundation. I've laid the foundation. So what is that foundation? Turn back one page, probably for most of us. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 2. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is the foundation. The foundation is Jesus. His foundation that he was building this local church on was good and it was right. And he says here that he laid that foundation. Paul was not in an office sitting back and coming up with some ideas and telling everybody else to go do it. He was in the process. He's the one who was physically helping to lay that foundation. And he did it completely and he did it accurately because he had the grace of God working in him to lay that foundation. And then Apollos comes along. Apollos, we're told that next phrase, another builds thereon. Apollos comes, he starts building on the same foundation that Paul was working on. He was preaching Jesus. There's a good word here. We need to know this word. I have laid a foundation and another, another builds thereon. That word another is important because in English, we'll use the word another to mean different things. Greek, there's two different another's. And I want us to look at a, a classic passage for this. Turn over to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Now, Paul is, is chiding the Galatians. You had everything going in your favor, and you turned from me. You stopped serving me. Notice he says in verse 6, I marvel, I am shocked that you are so quickly, so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto, here's our word, another gospel, which is not another. Okay, now in English that sounds weird. 
But those two words there, another and another, in verse 6 and 7, those aren't the same words. So we've got the first word. I marvel, I am shocked that you are removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel of a different kind. Unto something not the same, unto another of a different. Verse 7, which is not another of the same kind. Those are the two different words for another. One is of a different kind. One is of the same kind. In verse 10, back in 1 Corinthians, verse 10, I have laid the foundation, this word, and another of the same kind is building thereon. So here's what he's saying. Me and Apollos, we're on the same team. We got the same goals. We're pushing the same direction. Me and Apollos are the same. We have the same message. There's not, we're not competing against each other. It's the same word as well that is used. Remember when Jesus said, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go to heaven. Hey, it's okay. I'm going to send another comforter. Another comforter just like me. We're pushing the same direction, preaching the same message. This is this word that he's using here. Another of the same kind is building here. So why would he have to make that point? Because they're, they're fussing constantly with each other about this. We love Paul. We love Apollos. There's no need for this. We're on the same team. We are another of the same kind. But then we see this warning he gives. I've laid the foundation. Apollos has been building on it, what I had done, but let every man take heed how he builds their own. Here's his challenge. Here's his warning. And I'm going to paraphrase that phrase for you with some tenses added, and I think it will help it to make better sense for us. Here's the paraphrase. But... Let every man continually be careful. Continually be careful how he tries to build God's temple, the church. You need to be really cautious about how you are building. And getting back to my premise at the beginning, if you are a follower of Jesus and you are in this local assembly, you are building. There's not an option. You are doing it in one fashion or another. Now, some people take this, this phrasing to mean this is only this is referring to pastors and elders who are teaching the word of God. And it's saying here that you need to preach pure doctrine. I'm not going to argue that point. Part of you being built in this ministry is me and those teaching in this ministry giving you pure doctrine. We should not be trying to fit with the teachings of this world. We should not be trying to give you Doctrine that tickles your ears. It's just easy to receive. I should constantly be relying on the Holy Spirit to help me, to help other leadership here to stay true to the word of God. I'm not arguing that, and that is accurate. But notice the word that he uses here. But let every elder... Or every man. It's everybody. Let everyone, let every man take heed how he builds. It is not limited to leadership. It is not limited to, to anyone. It's every man. All of us. All of us. We are to be involved in making disciples. We are to be involved in exhorting believers. We are to be involved in restoring those who have strayed. We 
have a responsibility to build his church. And he uses that phrase, let every man take heed. Let every man be exceptionally careful what he does with his mouth. We better take heed. You know, James chapter 3 and verse 1, we're, we're warned about be not many masters, teachers. <clears throat> Don't be so quick to jump up and teach and to jump in and try to tell someone, okay, here are the areas in your life. You got to be this way. You know, James also says that every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We might word it this way, and this is crude. Just shut up and listen. Sometimes that's the best advice I can give anybody. Shut up and listen. Shut up is probably not the best word to use. Be quiet and listen. That sounds more polite. That's what we need to do. That's what James is telling us. Don't be so quick to interject your thoughts. Now, that doesn't mean don't teach. It means you better do your best to make sure that you are understanding and you're properly applying this book in people's lives. A key phrase, you, verse you have heard so often, um, Proverbs 18 and verse 13. It just went out of my mind. Proverbs 18, 13, somebody start me off. If we answer a matter before we hear it, we are shameful fools. It's folly and shame to them. He that answers a matter before he hears it, it's folly and shame. We better not jump into that fray. We better, using this word, take heed. Be careful before you start talking. I will say this. In my opinion, in my opinion, many that I have heard who have jumped into a conversation when they should not have, they've meant well. They really mean well. They don't want to hurt people. They don't want to be damaging people's lives. But we're going to see next week, we better be building with quality materials. And I'm just telling you, your, opin your opinions, your emotions, your little arguments, whatever it is, those aren't quality materials. Those are going to burn up. You better know what's going on in people's lives and apply this book properly to it. And you better be praying before you open your mouth. This is what he's talking about. Be careful. We're dealing with souls. We're dealing with each other's lives. He's saying, be careful how you do this building. It better be built on the truth of the word of God. That's where our focus needs to go. Your application statement, as we're filled with, controlled by the Holy Spirit, we'll continue building on the same foundation that Paul had built. We will be emphasizing Jesus Christ. What exactly was that foundation? Point B, only Jesus is sufficient. Jesus. Only Jesus is sufficient. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. The only foundation that is going to last in someone else's life, in your life, is Jesus. That's all that's going to last. And he's referring here, and again, back of uh, chapter 2, verse 2, I preach, I only preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. What he is referring to when he says, I preach Jesus, is he's looking at the redemption that comes through Jesus. He's looking at Jesus' perfect, sinless life. He's looking at his crucifixion. He's looking at the fact that Jesus took the wrath of God for my sin that he didn't deserve, he took that as a substitute for me. He took my place. That substitute, that is the means of my sin being atoned for. 
That's what Jesus did for us. And then the Godhead, all three members we see in our New Testament, all three members were included in this showing that Jesus sacrifice was acceptable by being part of his resurrection. Jesus was raised. He didn't stay dead. That is our foundation. That is preaching Jesus and him crucified. And this is exactly what the basis was of Paul's message. Now, I think most of us say, oh, of course. Yeah, we know this. We know that Jesus is the basis. I just want to say to you this, Jesus really is sufficient. We don't need anything else. We know that a lot of churches have deviated from this. A lot of churches don't follow this truth. People in this county, many of the people in this county, they are going to hold to tradition more than they'll hold to Jesus. As long as I do the church thing, as long as I, so I was sharing with me, wear the right ornament. If I have that ornament on when I die, I'm safe according to my tradition. As long as I follow my traditions, I will be okay. Wrong. Traditions do not save. Traditions are not what gives us a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes you'll see some people holding on to morality. I, I probably see this one more often than I do actually the tradition part. I live a good life. And many people do. They live a good life. They don't hurt people. They, they, they even believe in Jesus. I mean, the devil does too, but they believe in Jesus. And I'm living this good life. Therefore, when I stand before God, God's going to say, you're fine. You're fine. It, it's okay. It's not okay. God cannot overlook sin. He cannot, or he's not God. He's not sinless. He will have lied. God can't overlook sin. So all of these righteous works, and we know okay, our righteous works are like what? Filthy rags. God is not impressed. There is nothing I can do that will impress God. God is impressed. God the Father is impressed with his son, Jesus. So in order for him to be impressed, to use that word, with me, He's got to be seeing me through the eyes, through the, through the blood of Jesus. That is the only way that he's going to be impressed. We can be so quick to forget some of these truths. These righteous things don't help us. And we're going to see that in the next point that we see next week. Some people have totally massacred the word of God. And they try to explain it away with, we have to believe humanistic so-called science and we have to make that fit with the Bible. No, I don't. The Bible is right. And where a worldview of humanism goes against it, they're wrong. God is accurate. But we're scared to look ignorant. Listen, God is right. That's a point we just need to come, to come to grips with. His word is right. And what it says is accurate and we should stand for it without apology. Now, it's easy to look at this and to say, okay, I see this in other people. I see it if, if there's a false religion, if there is a religion that is, you know, we would say is weak. I can see it there, but let me just bring it home for a little bit. We can do the exact same things. We need to, okay, I'm using this word back in verse 10, take heed. We need to be really careful that we don't allow any of our extra biblical stands, any of, of our positions to be the foundation that we build on. It's not about my traditions. It's not about my stands. It's about this book. And this is what we need to build on. And this only. I have been in churches where the main teaching, the main preaching you're going to hear is, here are the standards you got to have and you better do them or you're not right with God. 
I'm summarizing really big there, but it's all about standards and it is not wrong. It is not wrong to have a standard. Standards are good. Standards are fine. But where scripture is not specific, we better hold those standards loosely. We better not be dogmatic when scripture is not dogmatic. This is what Paul is getting at. Paul is saying, Jesus must be the foundation, not your wishes, not your petty, divisive I like this speaker. I like this speaker. Those things should not be the foundation that we build on. So what happens if it is the foundation? Let's turn back to Matthew, the passage that was read earlier for us. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these things, these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. Why? For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat up on that house and it fell. And if it put a, a, a period there, it would still be good, but he makes it very clear and great was the fall of it. It wasn't a little fall. It wasn't a little mishap. Great was the fall of that house. So the one that it was safe, the one that was secure, that is the person who heard the teachings of Jesus and obeyed them. They did what they were told. They didn't add to, they didn't take away from, they did, they followed the word of God. That house was built upon a rock. I think everybody in this room would say, yeah, I want my house on a rock. I don't want my house to crumble. Well, the one whose house was built on the sand, that's the one who heard the truth and they basically rationalized it away. I don't need this in my life. I know I shouldn't. How many times have I, oh, this phrase. I know I should, you fill in the blank. And what's the next word? But, you know, just leave, put a period. Put a period, stop with the but. I know I should do, then do it. The one who heard the word of God and didn't do it, their life was built on sand. That's the one whose life collapsed. They didn't need to do it. They didn't need to proclaim it. They didn't, you know, The word of God just was not sufficient for them. And I just say that is a really dangerous place for us to live in. And that's why when Jesus said, great is the fall of it, that is a dangerous place for us to live. I know I've shared this illustration before. I don't remember how long ago. So if you hear it again, just, just kind of smile and nod like it's new and that'd be, that'd be nice. But the, when we lived in Oregon, there was a big deal because down they built these million dollar homes out looking over the Pacific Ocean. It was gorgeous. They had a wonderful place, but I guess they just didn't drill down deep enough to see what was under that dirt because it wasn't rock. Those houses literally were built on sand. They looked good. They had quality materials. They were million whatever dollar houses looking over this gorgeous view. And they started drifting. And they started heading right down that hill into that ocean. They had to get condemned. They had to be evacuated. Those houses were a loss. It didn't matter how good they looked. It didn't matter how much money was put into them. They were on sand. I hope you can see that illustration. It doesn't matter how good you look. It doesn't matter about your, your wealth. No, nothing matters. Are you built on the rock or are you built on sand? 
Are you following the word of God that you know, or are you not? You're going to do one or the other. That's what we all do. And it doesn't matter if you're militant about your beliefs. Nothing matters, any of this. Jesus alone is sufficient. He's the one we need. He's the one we need to run to and to look to for our answers. And anything, anything added to him perverts the building of God's temple. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what Paul's talking about in those two verses in 1 Corinthians 3. Your application statement. Jesus' redemptive work must be primary in our teaching and our outreach. Now, just as a reminder, again, the context here, Paul is rebuking this church for their division. He's rebuking them for these, these personal preferences. In their case, who my favorite speaker is. But these petty personal preferences, we can't let, we cannot, as a church, we cannot allow anything. These petty preferences on anything, we can't let these things cause useless divisions in us. That is not a working of God. It's not us taking a stand for something wonderful if, if they're petty personal preferences. Paul said in these verses, you better be continually careful about what you're teaching, about what you're pushing, about what you're insisting on within the church. It is a huge, huge issue. Our focus must be on Jesus and his redemptive work and his teaching, not just our application of his teaching. If we don't see it clearly in this book, you've got to hold it loosely, not firmly. If you're here today and you have never entered a relationship with Jesus, if you've never made peace with the God that every one of us have offended, that's the only teaching you really need to be concerned with this morning. We are totally hopeless without Jesus. That's why Jesus came and he paid the debt that you and I could never pay so that we can have that opportunity to put our Dependence in him alone to call on Jesus as Lord that he is. We would love to show you from this book how you can have this relationship if you've never received him. Christian, to whom much is given, much shall be required. We have this book. We have his blueprint. We know how we are to be investing in people's lives we know what we're to use we have not just the word of god we have the holy spirit left with us to remind us of the word of god and to interpret and to help us with the word of god what are we doing with it part of this admonition of being careful of taking heed about how you're building it assumes that you're actively trying to build, as we should be. If you are one who is not actively trying to help make disciples, to build people's lives, can I encourage you this morning? Ask God to help you. Ask him to give you, we saw this last, yesterday, ask him to give you this, this mindset, that general mindset of, I need to make disciples. I need to be involved in this process. And then as he reminds you, take steps. Actively get involved in people's lives. If that's something that, that you know you need to be doing, talk to me. I can set you up with somebody. We can make this happen to help you get started fulfilling the Great Commission. Be careful 
how you do it. Let's stand for a moment. If you've never become a follower of Jesus, you are hopeless without him. But he's willing to make you a part of his family. He's willing to make you a part of his building. If you'd like to know more, please pull one of us aside. Talk to us. We would love to help you. Christian, we have got to be careful. And we need to be anxious, I'll use that word, to be involved in building as well as we know how to do it. Let's ask God to help us get in the fight and not sit on the sidelines. You do business with God as Bethany Place. Stephen, can you close us, please? <laughs> 